Hey yo, what's up everybody? What's going on folks? Welcome to the True Trading Group live stream. I'm coming to you guys live from the Aria in Las Vegas. What a week it's been. What a day it is. Markets are testing those June lows. Welcome guys. I've got an amazing live stream in store for you guys today. A very special edition midday live stream with a very special guest. My name is Michael Edward, former award-winning hedge fund trader, now the current head trader at True Trading Group. Folks, I've been doing this now for going on about 16 years, began my career, worked out of funds right out of college, my very first job. And then 2008 happened, the Great Recession, the stock market crash. But the same year that I received one of the firm's Trader of the Year awards, I'm now the head trader of TTG. And along with my team of nine other professional trading mods and an over 20 person staff, we've helped thousands of members from all over the world, from all different walks of life, achieve their financial goals by learning how to trade and profit consistently in this market. TTD is now the fastest growing and highest rated premium online educational platform that combines university level trading and investing courses with premium stock market tools, workshops, mentorship on stocks, options, futures, crypto, for all styles of trading, whether you're a day trader or a swing trader, if you're just looking for long-term investing stuff, we do it all here inside of True Trading Group. We combine that university level of education with $5,000 worth of today's top financial tools. We give you access to about 10,000 of the most active, educated, most supportive and successful communities of traders that are out there. And of course, all the real-time alerts from the mods and I that have cumulatively been able to maintain about an 80% win rate over the last now going on two years. If you are new to this channel or this live stream, make sure you subscribe, smash the like button, turn on your notifications, guys, share this stream on your own social media. Trust me, this is going to be a fantastic one. You're going to want to reach out and educate and empower as many retail traders and investors out there as we possibly can. Now, folks, I want to just, with that being said, I want to take things on over. I don't want to waste another minute because I've got a very special, very important guest here today. His time is valuable. This is someone whose opinion and analysis I respect greatly. I look forward to his breakdowns every single day. I watch him every single day. And we just had some major, major, major events take place over this week, over last week with CPI data, the Fed meeting, a lot of stuff happening here this morning with different... Um, different banks around the world, different currencies, different bonds. And there's so much going on right now. So I don't want to waste another minute. Everybody give a huge, massive TTG warm welcome to the senior economics reporter for CNBC, Mr. Steve Leisman. Hey. Hey, Steve, what's up, man? How are you? You know, on the busy side of busy as it goes. Uh, oh, I can imagine. Around, as you might imagine. I could only imagine. That's why I said, you know, when I when I when when we heard that you were coming on today, and I woke up this morning and I see what's going on. I go, man, I was like, I wonder if Steve's going to be able yeah. to come on. I was like, he's probably so busy today. There's so much going on. So I, I really, really appreciate your time. The, the, the members and I, the viewers, we, we appreciate you coming on here. So I know you're on a tight schedule. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to dive right in, Steve. I got a, I got sure. a bunch of questions for you. Um, you know, first, when, when people see markets start to be moving to the downside, like they have, you know, now going on, you know, really going back since like the middle of August, People got very complacent. We had a nice little recovery there off of lows. And, and that that feeling of, of, of complacency and, and contentness has really evaporated pretty quickly. And these are the moments when, when people start to run around like their hair is on fire. But what I've been trying to convey to, to members and to viewers is like a lot of people that missed the, the, the COVID crash during 2020, it was so fast. It happened so quickly. Most people okay. weren't really prepared for it. Um, and a lot of people missed out on like that quick little valuation reset. Then everybody piles into the market in 2021 when valuations and premiums are at just like unforeseen, crazy, unsustainable levels. I, I've been trying to tell people that you, what's happening right now is like a valuation reset. And I think you're going to actually start to see the markets come back to fair value where you're not paying these crazy valuations. And the people that missed that opportunity in 2020 I feel like what's unfolding now, this valuation reset, maybe if we go back to, you know, I know Goldman Sachs dropped their, their um, multi target yeah. times. So like now you're starting to get into that fair value type of environment. And I, I, I want to know, would you say that valuations are going to be in a, are headed to a better place for people that have like a multi-year long-term outlook? And this is something that people that if you miss the opportunity in 2020, that this is something where the valuations are going to be more, fair value for lack of a better word. You know, I, I think they're going to be more logically and sustainably valued. I, I try to stay away. You know, everybody at CNBC does stocks. I do everything else but stocks. And I think there's yeah. a lot of smart people 
who talk about stocks, and I like to listen to them and, and, and take it in. What I like to tell people right now and what I've been telling them for several months is to get ready for a kind of new paradigm, a new relationship, which is that um, this is not a world, and a lot of people were trading, I want to say the beginning of this year through, uh, through you know, up until June maybe, and then again in June, with this idea that they're going to click their heels like Dorothy and go back to Kansas. I don't think we're going back to Kansas anymore. I think we're going to be living with a higher funds rate for a while and higher fixed income rates for a while. What, what does that do? Well, that changes the relative value of stocks against the risk-free rate. So um, to the extent that the market is adjusting to that and adjusting to that for the long haul, like you're not going to wake up tomorrow and the Fed's going to be cutting rates back down to zero, right. and you start to think about your investment horizon with um, you know, a, a higher funds rate, higher fixed income rate, more competition uh, in terms of return from the fixed income market, then I think you're being more realistic and you're setting yourself up for better long-term returns. But, but so many people were like, you know, maybe I'll just go to the bathroom and come back and the party will be on again, you know? And I don't think that's what's going to happen here. And I've been trying to tell people, I remember one time I went on Fast Money after um, the Fed Chairman Powell's Jackson Hole speech. I said, I'm just mad at you guys. And they're like, why? And I didn't mean mad at them. I said, I'm mad at y'all traders that think that weren't ready for Powell to say what he said and give that very short but sharp speech that really did not create much wiggle room in the Fed altering its policies and its course. Um, we had had several people on over the course of the week. We'd been out, you know, weeks before that reporting on Fed officials saying, look, we are not gonna, gonna hike up to a certain rate and then turn around and cut. And that pricing in the market for that cut was the Dorothy click your heels, we're going back to Kansas trade. Yep. Um, and I think some of that June rally was was that as well. It got a little excited on the June uh, CPI report. And what I've always said is that <clears throat> you can't ask data to do something that it's not designed to do. So that <clears throat> if the Fed tells you they're looking for several months of convincing uh, inflation data, that inflation indeed is coming down, you can't look to a single month to provide you with several months worth of data because it just ain't that. So yeah, we had a good June. And then as, as I, I have to say again, I was saying there were still several parts or several pieces of, of higher prices that needed to come through the system. One of them was housing, another was higher wages. So I didn't think we were out of the woods with that better June report or July report. And then we came back and we got a lousy one in August. Um, and I was frankly, not, I was surprised by how much it was on the core rate, but not surprised that it went up and not surprised that the market was was taken aback by the idea that it didn't go in that direction. It's going to take time. It we took us some you know months to get into this pickle. It's going to be months working out of it. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And you hit on something there that that was a, a message that we really portrayed to people. Once you got that July rally and, and you just went literally right to the next area that I wanted to go to. I'll touch upon some of the inflation data first. It's, very very specifically like that when we got that relief on the when we dropped from was it 9.1 um and then we went down to 8.5 it was all energy right. it, it was all it was all commodities it was all energy and and jerome right. powell's been very clear in that message that i'm not looking for inflation to come down because of commodities they don't they don't control prices of commodities they're looking for that core number and like you said there were issues there in the underlying numbers there for core and then people start pricing in after that july yeah. meeting yeah. rate cuts and 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 you went to the Jackson. You were talking about the Jackson Hole meeting. I've never heard Jerome Powell that hawkish in my entire life. I think everybody was just shocked at how stern he was. It was almost like an angry parent scolding the market. Like, <laughs> how dare you start pricing in rate cuts? I'm telling you, I'm raising rates. I'm keeping them there. You're not right, listening. Right. And he was so stern. And my question to you, Steve, is that you've spoken to him many times in person, virtually, you know, do you think, because this was something that I thought about after the Jackson Hole meeting, do you think that there's maybe a little bit of purposefully excessive hawkishness so that the market does the job, helps helps the Fed, help, helps them do the job? Because people got to realize, you know, we didn't always used to have the press conferences and the, the outspoken yeah. Fed 
verbiage right. and, the, and the things they say is another form of effective right. monetary policy. So I wonder what your thoughts are there. Do you think he's being excessively hawkish or do you think that's actually how hawkish their, their stance is going to be and remain? Yeah. So, I mean, that's really a great question and I wish I had a much better answer for it. Here's what I can, I, I know I can tell you. The Fed was very bothered by that June easing of financial conditions. And just so people understand what I'm talking about, uh, rates came down a little bit, but more importantly, the stock market rallied a lot um, and and the, those cuts were priced in. And the Fed was like, wait a second, the market's not hearing us. And so right. um, what actually happened with that speech is Powell sort of ripped up a longer, maybe less, uh, less stern, maybe more uh, uh, middle of the road speech and said, you know what? I only got six pages of stuff to say. And I, I will tell you um, a little backstory. Um, which is we had had a, um, an interview scheduled with Loretta Mester from the Cleveland Fed for a quarter to 10 Eastern time. We were out, we were out in Mountain Time. It was a quarter to eight at Mountain Time. But because the Jackson Hole Fed chair speech is usually very long, I, needed a, I, I wanted a long time to read it. So I canceled the speech with Mester because I thought I needed a long time to read it. Well, guess what? It took me about 12 minutes to run through those six pages twice. Um, and I did not need that time. There were guys that talked about, hey, I, I, I folded my, my, my arms, I put my feet up, and I was settled in for the 14-page speech. And well, there it was with six pages. Powell ripped that up and wanted to make sure there was no misunderstanding. Um, I don't know if you noticed uh, the question I asked him the other day. I said, I said Chair Powell, um, uh, is this a linear thing? Are you going to go straight up here, or is there a time you might want to pause? Right. And he goes, yeah, there's a time we might want to pause, but that's not now. We have right. a long way to go. And then the story I did today this morning was, you know, Powell, three months ago or in July, uh, he called the dot plot, which is the forecast of future rate hikes. He said, that take that with a grain of salt. Well, on Wednesday, he said, that's the likely path. That's a plausible right. path. And he said that outcome is likely. So um, uh, he is trying to make sure, yes, you're right. He's trying to bring forward uh, future tightening into today's market uh, to try to do what he can to as quickly as possible uh, get in front of this inflation problem. Remember, they're behind. They acknowledge they're behind. They acknowledge they screwed up here. And so we're all sort of paying a price on this. But bottom line is, um, right now, I don't hear any wiggle room. The only wiggle room that's going to exist, the only idea that he's being excessively hawkish is going to come from the data. And that data is going to mean uh, softening of the job market, uh, as well as uh, a lowering of not just, as you point out, core inflation, uh, so headline inflation, but also core inflation. I was just looking up those numbers you were talking about. And what happened to core is um, when uh, the headline went down from 9.1 to 8.5, core stayed the same, 5.9 to 5.9. I'm talking about the CPI here. And then core went down again, 8.5 to 8.3 in August, but the core jumped up 5.9 to 6.3. So that was plus 0.4%. And again, the Fed is trying to look beyond, as you point out, the commodity change and look at the broader change in prices in the economy. And that's what has it spooked. If this were just energy and food, if you could link this directly back to Russia, I think the Fed would have less of a problem with it and not be quite as, as stern or severe in its or as aggressive in its rate hikes. But the idea that it spread to other parts of the economy, the idea that they don't see the job market softening at all, they still see strong wages coming through. Um, I think they they still believe they have a long way to go, and they want to make sure the market understands that with a period after it, not a comma, a dash, or some kind of parenthetical. An exclamation point at the end, yeah. at the end of it. Um, yeah, um, to totally, totally agree. It's you know, it's the the whole with the there's too much geopolitical risk out there, you know, for them to feel comfortable with with just the the the, the drop in commodity prices because. There's just too many question marks out there that they can't rely on it. Can I, can I, just, um, I just want to add, I want to add just one thing, which is um, it's okay for you as an investor to have a different take on what the Fed's going to do. Perfectly fine. The Fed may not do what it says it's going to do, right. but that requires you to have a different theory of inflation, a different idea. If you want to sit back and say, I think inflation is going to be much lower, is going to come down more quickly. And therefore, the Fed will not have to raise as much and that the valuation challenge to stocks will be lessened. That's fine. But don't come to the table with an idea that the Fed is going to do less if you don't have 
uh, a more dovish view or or or, or a uh, a more optimistic view of the inflation outlook. One hundred percent, Steve. I literally. I have been preaching the exact same thing to 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 our our viewers, and it even sometimes when I see some people come on CNBC and they talk about, oh, yeah. well, we think that we think the Fed's going to pivot. It's like why, right. well, why don't don't base your your thesis on the minds of other people because they're, that's that's an impossible and a losing task. Like if if you believe that inflation is going to come down towards the end of the year, you think inflation is going to crack. Well, then that's your bullish reason, not. Because you think the Fed's gonna or Jerome Powell's right. gonna wake up one day and change his mind. Um, I, I want to go to the labor market. You just mentioned the labor market, and man, is it a catch twenty two right now? And, and I feel like, um, first of all, I'm, I'm just surprised at how tight the labor market still is. And what I've been telling people, what I really think happened here was the COVID pandemic pulled forward millions of people in early retirement and exiting the workforce and prevented millions of people from entering the workforce because there really was no work to enter. So like that really created this massive imbalance in the labor market. And that's why you have this situation where you get stuck with two open job positions for every one person looking for a job, bad for wage inflation, bad for headline inflation. But I feel like, and this is my thoughts and my theory, and I want to know kind of what you think about this. This, you know, the, the the upcoming recession here for 2023 that everybody's talking about, I, I think we're going to have a, a, a mild, modest recession. But I see a lot of people on, you know, on YouTube or social media, the doom and gloomers, we're going down 80 percent, people trying to get clicks and views. But I don't think it's going to be a deeper, severe recession because I feel like that tight labor market almost acts as a buffer for preventing a deeper recession. And I feel like it's 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 the. It's a thorn in the side of inflation because the labor market's so tight. But then as you go into that recessionary environment, the, the tightness of that labor market, which obviously it will soften, obviously unemployment will go up. Obviously, the initial jobless claims and numbers are not going to be as, as low as they have been these last couple of weeks. But I feel like that's needed to bring down inflation, but that strength acts as a buffer. What are your thoughts on that? Am I reading that correctly? Or, Well, I, I, I think you are. Um, and... I will tell you flat out, this is a very confusing time that doesn't have a perfect analog. Yeah. And while you were talking that, I was just checking one of my favorite numbers. Um, want to make sure I get it right here. Uh, let's see. 15, 16983. That's 16.9 million was the leisure and hospitality employment before the recession, uh, before the, the pandemic. And now it's 15.7. So you still have 1.2 million fewer jobs in the leisure and hospitality business. The overall employment level is at or somewhat above what it was before, but there are still industries that are scrambling to catch up to where they were. Um, and so I'll tell you my two thoughts on this. My, my, my first thought is an out of sample idea, which is that um, I think hiring people is actually good for inflation. Um, if you get um, if you get more people in the workforce, that's more supply, um, and that would help bring down inflation. Think about the places where, you know, maybe there were three or four restaurants on your street at your local town, and now there's two. I mean, they just get away with a better price than they otherwise could. More people working at the car factories, more people there means we maybe get our supply more in order. The trouble that we have is that people dropped out of the workforce, as you suggested. More people retired early. Um, we, by the way, have uh, fewer immigrants in this country, maybe as few, maybe as many as 1.25 million fewer legal immigrants in this country because of changes to the immigration rules that began under Trump were continued under Biden. My understanding is the Biden administration is trying at the moment to loosen up or try to speed up some of the applications for uh, uh, legal immigration into the country. Um, by the way, if you have if you don't have a college degree and you live and you're trying to get into this country, there's no actual legal way for you in. That's one of the reasons why everybody comes for, for asylum. We can have that discussion. I know it's a politically charged one, but but in any event, um, that's one aspect of the of the uh, deficit when it comes to workers in this country. Something that's yeah. driving up wages. Um, but your your substantial question, I think, is a good one, and I generally agree with it. That ultimately. Um, there will be a cushion to how bad this can get because of the demand for labor um, and because of 
the idea that you're not going to get the fall off. It's one reason why you can't say we're in a recession now. If we're in a recession right. now, um, you have never had the job market react this way in a recession. I did some work it's several months ago. It's going to be a little old now. But the basic swing was something like 4 million jobs that um, if we were in a recession, as people suggested at the beginning of January, um, through the six month period, I think I did this at the end of June, we would have been down 700,000 jobs if we were a typical recession. Instead, we were up 3.2 million. And now that number and that gap has actually grown so that from a, from a recession standpoint, we ain't there yet. And I know the guys at the National Bureau of Economic Research who date these, uh, these recessions, um, they can't do it. They can't call it a recession with these kind of jobs numbers. And it's going to be tough for them even now. I mean, uh, it may be that we start to get that reaction in the job market, but we may not. And it, it's, it's, I don't know that they could call it a recession if you're growing jobs two, 300,000 a month. It's going to be very difficult. And that's going to keep with the paychecks. But the question is this, this race between the demand of the workers who are working and their new paychecks and inflation and their contribution of supply. I, I mean, I think that if, if you ask me, the most important thing is we got to get China back online. China just happens to be, for whatever you think about it, good or bad, it's it's the it's the factory, the manufacturing facility of the United States, and it's yeah. not. We're not going to have things right inflation wise. If you if I were to write the Goldilocks scenario for bringing down inflation, three things would happen: the the Ukraine war would end tomorrow, mm -hmm. China would come back online. And millions of people who dropped out of the workforce would come back in. Those three things would solve inflation in a big way in a hurry. Um, but I would monitor those three things for an indication of whether or not we're getting the supply chain and the whole issue of supply and, and supply-driven inflation back under control. Awesome. Uh, Steve, man, I, lo I love your analysis. Um, and, and also the, the labor participation rate which we saw the labor participation rate start to climb back up to where it was pre-COVID. Like I said, deflationary event right there. That can keep going. And, and specifically, yeah. you know what, what I found really interesting when you looked into the details of the labor participation rate, the older demographic, it's that that 50, 50 age plus, because those are a lot of the people that exited the workforce early. And maybe now with inflation and prices, they're like, oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe I couldn't retire and, and they're coming back into the workforce. If, if we can still, and I'm wondering if, I know you you keep an eye on the economic data a lot more even even than, than I do, but are you still seeing any other data of like that older demographic coming back into the workforce? Because I, I talk to members and, and I keep telling people, like once we got that negative GDP print two quarters in a row, I was like, well, well that's the technical definition of recession, but how can you get jobs? This is the, the pandemic turned the economy and the, and the rule book yeah. on its head. It's, like it doesn't, it, it's this is so, so, so unique where people have jobs and job security and the market is down 20, 30 percent. That's that's not normal. You're you're in, you're adding jobs while the market's down 20, 30 percent. I've never seen that before. No, we've never lived through this, but anyway, we've never lived through a pandemic. And right. um, one of the things I think that's going to be necessary uh, it, it, to bring older workers back is is uh, some kind of assurances or some or a, a feeling of confidence about their health in the workforce. And the the, the, the these new boosters could help a bit. Um, the idea that you know the the president said he thinks the pandemic is over for what that's worth, um, but a sense that I'm not going to go to work and get sick and die is probably a pretty important sense. So I think that's important. Um, uh, th there's other things that we can do to, to bring people back in. Maybe the decline of the market. I hate that idea, but but maybe something that brings some people back. Um, we're pretty good on the um, participation rate of workers uh, in the uh, prime age working group, 25 to 54. I think that's back to where it was. Um, there's still child care issues that are out there. Um, I did the work on this. God, I should have updated this number. It's such an important number. But the, 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 we were down at one point. 100,000 child care workers in this country. Um, wow. And getting back to something I talked about earlier, um, and by the way, we're also down in the health and uh, human services area there. Um, these visas for au pairs, the au pairs couldn't come to the country. Well, what does that mean? It means the people who rely on the au pairs couldn't go to work. So we still have that issue to, to work through. Um, all of that is a little bit of upside optimism there, that if we can work these darn things out, we can get back to sort of normal the way we were. Um, 
I would think about this, and I, I got to leave you with this parting thought because I got um, more stuff to do. I maybe give one more question if we can, but um, I don't think the funds rate settles at 4.6 or 5%. It may have to go up there for a while, but I would not think about an investing world where the funds rate back at one or two. I think yeah. you think about a 3% funds rate on a longer run uh, a, a, a rate here. That's where I would I would think it might settle down. And my thinking is this: it's two percent uh, uh, is it would equal the inflation rate, and then that funds rate ought to be real by a half a point or a point. So two and a half to three, um, and and maybe we get there in the next couple of years. But we're going to have to see inflation come down and stay down before the Fed can think about adjusting to a longer run rate. But the point is that longer run rate is not going to be the zero that gave you the 500 valuations on some of these uh, high-flown tech stocks that never made any money to begin with. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and and, and Jerome Powell said it too. He said in his, in his um, the last time he spoke about we need we need real positive rates. And and that I means even if we get right. to two 2.5, that means you're looking at a three 3.5 Fed funds rate. Um, That's how capitalism works. It doesn't work with 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 no premium on lending you money for the future. The idea that we've been through this aberrational period of zero funds rate. And well, what happened? Companies that made zero money were able to get financing and go into business. Well, that's, I think the, I think that's kind of over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome, Steve. I, I, I know you've got to go. I just, I, th I just think this is such a, I just think that this is such a huge opportunity right now with, for, for people with jobs that, that want to get involved, that maybe watched, you know, stocks go down in 2020, they watch valuations and, and they watch everybody else make money you know, in all these crazy things like crypto and all these meme stocks and all these other tech stocks, like you said, that don't make money, but go up 500, you know, trading at 500 times. I just feel like this is such an opportunity right now with the labor market the way it is. I've, I've never right. seen it down 20, 30% and everyone's got a job. I just think the opportunity right now for people that want to understand what's happening because it's not, you know, it's not all the doom and gloom. There's a lot, there's a lot of positives here that we can look forward to. You got midterm elections, you got the seasonal strength at the end of the year. Um, and like I said, if inflation does crack and if we get some of the things that you had mentioned that help inflation, you know, it can turn out can turn out to be a really good opportunity for people that want to get involved. I'm, I'm still investing. I'm not changing much of what I do, which is I take a bunch of money out of my paycheck every every month and 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 go for it. And uh, I I know a lot of stuff, but I like to say I know enough to be confused. Um, and so I don't I don't think I can time this thing. But but I think if I keep investing, I'm going to end up better for it at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, Steve, listen, I, I got a free membership at True Training Group for you, man. Whenever, <laughs> anytime you want it. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, thank good. you for that. And uh, I appreciate the I appreciate the, the good questions and, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome, Steve. Thank you so much, Steve. Is there anything that you wanted to anything you want to promote or you've got anything coming up or anything that you want to mention to the to the viewers? That well, if anybody wants to go see a Grateful Dead band, check out the Stella Blues Band. We're uh, the, the finest Grateful Dead tribute band in the New York area. And I'm a member of the board of directors of Riverkeeper trying to save the Hudson River because I don't think I can save the world, but maybe we can save a single river. And you may have a um, uh, you may have a Riverkeeper in your town, uh, or if you don't, we have the Hudson Riverkeeper that I'm on the board of directors of because who can uh, uh, argue with clean water? That's all I want to say. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. I, I appreciate your time so much for coming. I know you're My super pleasure. busy. The TTG fam. Guys, everybody, give a huge thank you to Steve for spending some time with us here today and just dropping all of his knowledge and experience um, onto us. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I, I hope all the best, you guys. Soon. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, doom and gloom. The market's going down 80%. No, it's not. I'm excited about what's happening. I'm happy about what's happening. You are going to be getting fair valuation for your long-term investing portfolios, folks. Something you haven't seen in a while. That was amazing. Thank